uh, you all know that a good picture is worth a thousand words, so I thought I'd make the best of my seven minutes by just showing you pictures. I would like to start here with a picture, and all of these pictures have changed the way we see modern public health. This is a picture of a map of London, of Soho, 1854. Uh, in the middle of one of the big cholera epidemics uh, at the time, and we had these uh, epidemics everywhere. And as you know, probably at the time people thought that all these diseases were transmitted by some kind of toxic substance in the air, and you would get it like that, and there was really nothing you could do to protect yourself. And then this doctor here, called John Snow, he started realizing that there was a clustering of cases uh, around certain places, and he started investigating. He realized that in some places where, for example, in the brewery, all the people who were, or the men working in the brewery, they were paid in beer, so they never drank any water, and so they never got cholera. Or in other houses that had their own well, also people did get cholera, although they were exposed to the same air. And so he realized it must have to do something with water. And he identified the culprit as one of the pumps in the area. And as soon as he neutralized this pump, the cholera outbreak failed. And it was, of course, a very important uh, discovery about two decades before people started investigating bacteria and realizing that diseases could be transmitted by biological agents. Now, John Snow is a failed academic. His publication in The Lancet was never accepted. The Lancet even made fun of him. And in a good English sense of humor, three years ago, The Lancet uh, published an official apology to him. That's 155 years later. <laughs> The second picture uh, is an exquisite uh, drawing by uh, Florence Nightingale. You probably know the name because she's known especially as the founder, so to speak, of modern nursing. But what fewer people uh, know is that uh, Florence Nightingale was also a fantastic medical uh, statistician. And she was a successful academic because she was the first woman elected to the Royal Statistical Society. And what she did when she was following uh, the British Army in the Crimean War uh, around 1850 is to make a drawing or record all the causes of death. And something really extraordinary, bizarre, paradoxical appeared in that. Here in red, and unfortunately the beam is not very good, but in red are all the men who died on the battlefield of gun wounds, etc. In blue, it's all the soldiers who died of disease, cholera, dysentery, typhus, etc. And you see immediately the problem of the army was not the soldiers getting killed on the battlefield. The problem was really all those dying of all these diseases. And that brought enormous progress, uh, in this case, unfortunately, to armies. Now, a little bit of trivia for your next uh, uh, winter uh, evening. What are the most uh, deadliest animals in the world? So, at the top here, the group of the total losers. You have the shark, for example, you get the wolf, you get the lion. They kill a few people per year, so it's really totally insignificant. The difference is, of course, that Every time somebody gets killed by a shark, it's in the newspapers, you know about it, but really sharks are the total losers. <laughs> then the snakes and coral start to be a little bit better, but really when you start to enter the kind of senior league is with the dog here, about 25,000 deaths per year because of rabies, etc. And then uh, yeah, snakes here. Then you enter a total different order of magnitude, and that's the humans. Humans who are really good at killing each other. So about <laughs> half a million uh, people get people by other people uh, each year. But who is the winner? The winner, ladies and gentlemen, is the mighty mosquito. Mosquitoes kill probably almost a million people per year because of diseases such as malaria, uh, yellow fever, etc. And I've taken this graph from another failed academic, and that's Bill Gates, because he fortunately developed a big interest in mosquitoes, actually not really in mosquitoes, but in killing mosquitoes, so that we can uh, try to do something about public health. Now, with all this public health knowledge and efforts going on the way, I think it's time to look a little bit at how things have changed over time, because we live in a world that is so different from 50 or 100 years ago. This is from a website called gapminder.org, and uh, it's been set up by another failed academic, that's Hans Rosling, but he went on to do fantastic work in vulgarization of science. 
that he presents data in a unique way. This is child mortality. It's the proportion of children who die before they reach their fifth birthday. That's on the left scale here. It's on the log scale. So as it, we go to the top, it gets uh, uh, bigger and bigger. This is about a 10% mark. Just make a mental note of that. 10% of the children don't reach their fifth birthday. Here we are in the year 1966, so exactly 50 years ago. On the bottom, we have the income per person, so adjusted dollars per person per year. So it's basically how wealthy countries are. Each bubble is a country. The size of the bubble is the size of the country. So you see very clearly China here, the big red bubble, and India, the big light blue uh, bubble. We have a lot of countries where 20% of the children die before their fifth birthday. And that's 1966. Okay, most of you are quite young, but it's not that far away. And many countries are very poor. Jump to 2012, so basically our time, many countries have moved to the right, have gotten much richer. But the most striking feature from health point of view is there's virtually no country left above 10% of mortality. So that's before, that's today. We live in a world that's infinitely better from the health point of view. And my last slide is about the question that we are all asking. If fewer children die, are we going to have a population explosion? It's a real war, and nobody really kind of, it's not very politically correct to ask that question publicly, so I do it for you. But fortunately, there is a very satisfying answer, and the answer is very clearly no. Because what happens, and that's the last graph here, also from Gapminder, if you look at fertility rate, that means the average number of uh, children that the woman will bear, it is not falling, it's really, it's extraordinary, it's going down extraordinarily fast. You see here China, you see India, you see African countries, you see uh, uh, South American countries. Everywhere, when there is less death, women have less children. So the conclusion, inevitably, is we live in a fantastic world. It's healthier than it's ever been. It's richer than it's ever been. It's also, by the way, better educated, it's safer. So it's wonderful. And isn't that a good conclusion to this story? Thank you.